Friends, it's Diane here. I have Ian Petrella with us, and he's here um, to talk to us today about hope and moving forward and life in general. You probably would recognize him from A Christmas Story because when he was a child, he was in that movie. And now he is an amazing, talented adult living his vision. Everything from improv and puppetry and other forms of acting, he has continued to bring his gift to the world, starting when he was really little. So you've already heard from other actors who were child actors on A Christmas Story. And so now I have a chance to get Ian on the stage and see what he has to say about how things really are and the importance of connection to people who are important to you, like the other Christmas Story actors. So welcome, Ian, to the show. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, we're all doing great. So tell us a little bit about how you got in the movie. Like, what was that like? Because I, I think you were acting before you even got into the Christmas Story movie when you were young. But tell everybody a little bit about what that was like for you, landing it, getting it. Did you know it was a thing? <laughs> all that kind of things. I mean, at first, you know, the, the, the whole story, I mean, it really wasn't that you know, spectacular of a story because it was, I mean, it was just a, a, you know, a routine audition that you do. You're a child actor, you do these all the time. They call you up, they say there's a part, you go, you audition for it. If you get it, great. If you don't, you just move on to the next one. You're more used to not getting them than you are getting them. So when you do get one, it is going to be a little bit more exciting because it's a lot like winning the lotto um, when you get an audition. Um, this particular one, I didn't know too much about what it was going into it. Mm -hmm. They just said they're doing the holiday movie. They need to fill the role of the little brother. That's it. Mm -hmm. So you go down there. And, you know, Randy really didn't have a lot of lines. So it wasn't really a reading as it was more of just trying to find uh, the personality, if I could match it. Right. Also, the main thing is, could I pass for playing Peter's brother? So that was the big, that was the big one, which right. evidently, I, I guess I, I, I did. <laughs> right. Even though we look nothing alike, you know, at least nowadays. But so after that, you go through a callback. So they want you to meet the producer or the, or the director. I think at that point in time, it was just one of the producers. Then they liked me so much. Uh, Bob wanted to meet me in person, Bob Clark, who's the director. So he flew me up to his home in Boston at the time. And I did a screen test, which basically was just going to his house and just kind of acting out the scenes. Still not really knowing too much what's, what's going on. And uh, he's like, well, congratulations, you got the part. That was exciting, knowing that this is your first movie. Now, as far as making it, I always say there's, there's, there's three emotions that you go through. One is you're making a movie, um, which is exciting. You get to see how movies are made. Two, you know this movie is going to be in theaters and you're going to be in it. So there was a lot of different emotions going going through my head as an eight year old. Right. Um, I was very aware of what I was doing. Like a lot of people ask, you know, did you know what you were doing? Like, hell yeah, I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I was going to be in a movie. You know, this was my job as an eight year old. I mean, right. I, you know, th this is what I did and what I already love to do. So, so I was very, you know, you have the excitement of an eight year old. Mm -hmm. But then you still sort of have some professionalism because, you know, this is your job. Right. So. So you have a job as an eight year old. And so you're right. right. You have to like have the job and the job trained you from the time you were very young to learn how to handle being told no. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and um, so you learn very young, right, how not to personalize things. It's just move on to the next thing. Well, I guess also learning, learning no um, at a very early age, you know, really, I just got used to it, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> because now people say no, and it's like, all right, 
(laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. And so there's value in that knowing how to handle no. And there's also that training of, okay, you know, we can say no and we can keep on going and it's not about you. So how did you get along with all the other kids in the movie when you guys were shooting? Did y'all get along like you were really like brothers and friends and things like that? Or was it more distant? Oh, no. I mean, well, I mean, considering I was the youngest, you know, they didn't really want to hang out with me that much Mm. because they were, you know, they were, they were all like Mm preteens. So they were kind of getting, they were moving away from those, you know, childhood, you know, ideas and moving on into say girls. (laughs) I'm still eight. So, you know, if they wanted to go, do something more, you know, I don't want to say adult, but yes, adult, you know, they're not going to have an eight year old tagging along with them. So, but once we started shooting solely in Canada on the sound stage and doing all the interior shots, it was just me and Peter the whole time. So that's where Peter and I are, you know, our bond really grew more. And we, we were like, brothers in a sense you know we got along like brothers but we also fought like brothers Mm -hmm. so there was um i know one particular if you if you ever watched the the movie again the scene where we're sitting listening uh to the radio of little orphan annie Mm -hmm. and that whole scene i don't know what what went wrong but me and him were not getting along that day and during that scene Cause they yell cut and then we would like yell and, you know, slap each other and fight. Oh, and then my. they would say, you know, okay, back, back to one action. And then we would just go back to being, you know, friendly and cut, like mm, hate you, you know, mm, mm, just, you know, <laughs> and, and getting at each other. I don't know what we were fighting about, but we just, we, I know, I remember just, we weren't getting along. So, and that's all part of acting is where, you know, you don't get along, but you have to act like you do. So you see it a lot of times, like they'll have these, you know, these, these clickbait ads and say, you know, oh yes, they played best friends on the movie, but in real life they were enemies. That's, you know, a lot of times it's shocking. You're like, how do they not like each other and act? That's bizarre, but it's true. So (laughs) yeah, even though you're actors, I mean, you're still, you know, at the end of the day, you're still people. So Right. And like you said, it's your job. And so when it's time yeah. to work, you work. And then right. you're, you're still a human being with your all of your emotions and experiences, including that all the time. So, of course, yeah, it's gonna, but I think usually with actors, it's always, you know, it's always some ego thing, some narcissistic, you know, <laughs> ego thing that they fight over, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that that um you guys, all, that all you boys as kids were having ego things going on that early? Probably. Probably. Why yeah. not? <laughs> if not, Why it not? was kind of starting, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, that's, it's, that's kind of what, you know, and, and not that I'm trying to knock it, but I mean, that's definitely what this, this business does. And, you know, being an actor does for you is it does, you know, it, it, it definitely can inflate the ego. Why not? I mean, you're, you know, you're going to be put on screen and everybody's going to see you and everybody's going to love you. And that's a fantastic feeling. Mm-hmm. And if you're not prepared for it, it can go to your head and you could do some, some damaging things. Other people take it, you know, very, very well. Uh, some don't, I don't know. I don't know how I'm taking it. So it's all a weird thing. So Yeah. Life has all its twists and turns. So I want to talk a little bit about improv mm-hmm. and because I have, I have a friend of mine who is a psychologist and he uses improv a lot with helping his adolescent boys. He's a therapist and he uses improv to help them process their emotions and feelings and things. And I have a 15 year old I work with who loves improv. And so when I saw that in your bio, I'm like, I had this attraction to it. And so how did you get involved in improv did it just kind of drop in your lap or what's the, what is the attraction with you with oh that? no um improv i mean it's something that i wanted to pursue mm-hmm. because when i was about actually at the same age like 15 um is when i started you know i wanted to get into comedy but i didn't want to do stand-up 
I wanted to, my my heroes were like Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, John Candy, you know, anybody from early Saturday Night Live to, you know, SCTV. And all those cats came out of Second City in Toronto and Chicago. Mm-hmm. Well, I couldn't afford to move to Chicago or Toronto. So there was a, a place in Los Angeles still there to this day. It is very popular now called the Groundlings. Mm-hmm. And they were and still are one of the biggest improvisational institutes in Los Angeles. So I wanted to go study there. And that was just because I just wanted to go follow in the footsteps of my heroes Mm -hmm. and learn sketch comedy. Cause that's really what I was into more as opposed to like doing stand up. Um, I wanted to learn sketch comedy. So it wasn't something that fell in my lap. I mean, I, I pursued it. Um, It was definitely something I wanted to do. It's just really hard at the time because I was still in high school when I started doing it. Mm -hmm. And at first they weren't going to allow me to join at least take classes because they said, you're, you're just too young. You're going to be working with adults. Will you be able to keep up with them? But they gave me a shot and I, I went through the basic class and I did, I did very well. It was until I got to intermediate, I had to take that twice. And then I was about 19 when I was basically was, I didn't get kicked out, but I was asked, you should not do this for right now. And it was just basically because of my age. You know, you're 19 years old. I'm just out of high school. And I'm dealing with like 20 and 30 year olds who have like got so much experience in life. And of course, you know, at 19, you're a little bit more rebellious towards things. (laughs) So, and it's not that I was trying to be edgy or, you know, raunchy. It's just, and certain things I'd, I'd push back a little bit, like, no, this is it, it, my thing is funnier than what ego. And yeah. um, there it is. So um, but improv after that, I did continue on, you know, another uh, um, other institutions of, of improv. And it's it's a lot of fun, but it's very it's a very, very difficult uh, craft for comedy. Um that's why when you see, you know, people who do it, you know, you think it's easy. It's really not. It, it's not easy at all because the, the hardest the one thing about improv is it's not always about you're not always going for the joke. Like most comedy is you want to go for the joke and go for the punchline. Improv is completely different than that. It's really more about you have to listen more to what the, uh, cause you're working with other people right. on the stage. So you really, it's, it's, it's all about give and take. And they always, they start you off with an exercise called yes. And, and one person starts and then all you do is you just go back and forth feeding information. And hopefully out of that, that's where you can find the joke oh, okay. and find the punchline. So it's not about going out and just being I'm Mr. Wacky Man, you know, center <laughs> of attention. Um, some people are, you know, but and I always found that when I did improv, I was always better as not necessarily the straight man, but the second. Like if I was on stage and I had somebody who was really over the top and was really funny, um, I was really good at just kind of backing them up, oh, neat. you know, yeah. letting them take center stage, you know, help listening to what they're going to say and then try and feed them information mm-hmm. so that they can get the joke out. Cause it's like, clearly they're a funnier person than me. So I'm not going to, you know, I had to learn how to tone down my ego when I was doing improv later on. And that, you know, I realized I'm really better as the second and not the first. So it's like, like being in a band, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I used to play bass guitar and my dad's a, a bass guitar musician. And he always told me that when you play bass, he says, your, so- your number one sole job is to make the solo sound good. Right. Right. So I, I always kind of considered myself as comedy is more like a bass player than, you know, a lead guitarist. Right. So. Right. That's a really good analogy too, because it's, and it's so important to be in that 
that role, though, because if you're not listening and feeding the right information and as a bass guitarist, if you're not in that space, then the whole depth and quality of what's happening is right. different. It's kind of compromised because people don't maybe necessarily realize it, but where's that piece, that depth? And so, but like you said, somebody who's all in their ego might miss that valuable piece, you know? Right. That That's why they always said, you know, they, they said, you know, one of the hardest people to do improv with was Robin Williams because he, he's just so over the top. And he just knows how to control everything. And he can just, he's a one man show, mm -hmm. you know, and he can just, you know, continue. And they, I, everybody said it was like, you know, the hardest person, nobody really liked to do improv with him because he would just take over, but that was his personality. The only person who was able to top Robin Williams was Jonathan Winters. Cause that's what, that was his idol. So, right. right. <laughs> and you're talking about some very skilled people at that. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I think improv is really, really fun to be in the audience and watch it all unfold and see it. And when my 15 year old that I work with is doing it, he's learning it. And he's <laughs> what I think he's going to be one of those over the tops. <laughs> like, you know, right. he, he already kind of is. And um, and he's he's loving it. And so it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. So that's why I wanted to ask you about it. I'm like, I got to ask you about that. <laughs> no, I think it's it, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. And I can see where, you know, it comes in as far as, um, you know, therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I can see how that, you know, can, you know, can, can come into play. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, if you can, if you can nail it, then, you know, you, you are definitely, I would say a strong comedian. Oh, that's so. great. Yeah. And it's, and I like that it's different than stand up. It, it, there's a different quality to it. And both have right. great, both have great value. And it's, it's neat to hear your side of it, see what it's like as somebody who does it. And so, and I want to fast forward a little bit because sure. I have so many more things I want to ask you about. I'm like, oh, okay. wait, hold on a second here. Um, you mentioned um, about puppetry. Right. And I also find that to be very cool. <laughs> like I'm, I'm learning about you and I'm going, I love that too. Hold on. I love that too. It was one of those kinds of things. And so what attracted you to puppetry and um, how does that feed your creativity? Well, um, that's something I've always been into, even as a kid, uh -huh. you know, I, you know, I, I was a, a Muppet fanatic when I was a kid. Me too. Me too. So I, I, I love Muppets like everybody else. Not so much Sesame Street, but I was more the, Muppets. The Muppets, right. Uh, yes, the Muppet show. <laughs> and then when the movie came out, it was, you know, and I didn't understand what these things were at first. Um, I remember as a kid, I just thought, I thought they were like robots. And mm -hmm. someone said, no, they're puppets. It's a human hand inside, you know, doing the mouth. I was like, well, that's even cooler. <laughs> um, so just through, you know, through, through life, um, you know, and growing up, I was always into, you know, um, puppets and watching puppets. It wasn't until later on in life that I got into it. Um, I was working um, on a show and the show was, it was like a, a, a puppet show, but it was more like, the Simpsons. So it was more geared towards adults than it was just for kids. Right. Now I was just there to be a production assistant and help out and build sets. And then one day the director who was a friend of mine, you know, I asked him if I could see one of the puppets and I started playing with it. And he's like, actually, you're really good. Let's get you, you know, in front of the camera. And so that kind of kicked off the idea of doing, you know, uh, puppetry. So I started working with that company a lot and working on all their projects and then it's just something i you know really really loved um i, I love the idea it's it's acting but it's not with this your face it's with a, a completely different inanimate object um the unfortunate thing is at the time that i got into puppetry it was kind of the worst time to get into puppetry because it was the nineties. Mm. So a lot of the practical ideas of effects um, were starting to get moved away and computers were coming in. 
And so in the 90s, we had this big rush of, you know, CGI and computers. So there really wasn't a whole lot of puppetry jobs going around. Um, and I didn't know anything about computers at the time. So it wasn't I, I just couldn't, you know, switch gears and, you know, go into computers. And I was like, no, I still want to do puppetry. So I kind of had to just go, you know, the independent route and try and create my own ideas. Um, but puppetry can be expensive. That's that was mm -hmm. the problem. So because <laughs> it costs money to make those things. Right. Um, it's it's a lot different now, like materials are a lot cheaper and trying to learn. Like I said, I mean, this was, you know, the 90s. So trying to learn how to make these these characters was just all trial and error. Now you just go on YouTube. You just say, I want to build this type of puppet. And there's a whole tutorial now. Right. So it's really easy for, you know, anybody who wants to get into it. Um, there are companies now that sell patterns on how to make these things. I mean, it's, it's an easy, easy thing to do. Um, now it's starting to make a comeback. Um, people are, you know, filmmakers and television are starting to go back to the idea of, you know, doing um, practical, you know, characters mm -hmm. and practical effects as opposed to just solely doing, um, you know, CGI now. Because I think there's a sort of nostalgia that people feel when they see a puppet. Um, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a weird, weird world because when you tell people you do puppeteering, they automatically think, you know, of like children's birthday parties. <laughs> right. Now I used to do those. So those, <laughs> not, would still, not... those would be fun, but that's not all there is. It's like a yes and, it's... right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there, I, I did, I worked with a company up in Pittsburgh and, they, you know, they wanted to break into film and television and we were doing, you know, kids birthday parties to help pay the rent. And it was fun because it's, you know, if you love what you do, then who cares where you're doing it? And right. that was the thing. I just had fun doing it because it was his puppets. Um, but, you know, you know, when, when you, you want to be ambitious and you want to take everything to the next level. And that's what we were trying to do with the company is go to the next level, next level. So um, my friend who runs the company, Gwen, um, she's now a uh, ventriloquist. So that's what she does. Yeah, she has her own ventriloquist act now. So I don't I don't really do ventriloquism um, I because I, I like that's one of the reasons why I like doing puppetry is I don't have to be seen. I have something else, you know, I can pull something else out and act through that. And, you know, cause I, I don't want this. I want this to go away and just have, you know, this. So. <laughs> right. And so you're acting with your voice and your mouth and that coordination piece. Right. And making that thing come alive, right. you know, taking, taking an inanimate an object that really, you know, doesn't have any facial expressions and you have to give all of your emotions through um, through the body and making that thing come alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's to me, that's the fun part. Yep. That's the fun part of doing it. So. Right. And so somebody who's a really good puppeteer, if you're sitting watching them, watching whatever they're doing, you're like in it with them, like the Muppets, like. When the Muppet movie came out, I was all over it. I'm like, I have to go. I love the Muppets. And um, because they came alive. Right. And you know, they're not alive, but boy, they were alive. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. And that's, that's where the art is and the skill is. Do you also, think that, I mean, oh, go ahead. I was going to say one of the things that I like about um, puppetry, as opposed to say the difference between animation, because you know, they are basically, you know, almost the same. They're both a form of animation. The only difference is you can never actually meet Mickey Mouse. Now you go to Disneyland, you know, there's some guy walking around in a suit. That's not Mickey Mouse. That's a guy in a suit dressed up as Mickey Mouse. Right. But you can meet Kermit the Frog. Mm -hmm. You could actually sit down and have a conversation with Kermit the Frog. Right. Because even though it's a puppet and it's fleece and, you know, cloth and foam, there's still a guy inside, you know, 
whoever's doing him now, I think it's Matt Vogel who's doing him now, but, you know, went through Henson and Whitmire and now it's, you know, we're on our third Kermit. Um, but you could still sit down and meet that person. You can meet that, that character and have a conversation. And the guy can be right in front of you with the puppet talking to you and you're just focused on the puppet. You don't even pay attention to the guy. So that's another reason why I like it is that you can do it for film and television, but then you can step off and actually interact with people. So that's that one of the things that I, that's one of the things that I wanted to do um, with puppetry is do something similar to that, where, you know, once I moved back to California and Los Angeles, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity because, you know, it's a very vibrant city mm -hmm. um, as opposed to where I was living. So it'd be nice to go out and build a bunch of characters and just go in, in the public and interact with people. <laughs> that would be so fun. And that with your improv skills and everything, that right. would be a blast. <laughs> but with COVID, everything shut down. Right. So I, I, I couldn't do it. So now I'm just in the process of just continue building and hopefully, you know, because I really wanted to go to like bars and restaurants and do it. And that was the number one thing that got closed down, especially right. bars. Um you know, that's where you want to go where, you know, the drunk people are with this stuff. <laughs> that's where you're going to get the most interesting, you know, characters. Um, but since everything closed down, <clears throat> I've had to rethink what, what am I going to do now? So, right. But I'd save that idea. So when it all opens up again, because <laughs> that would be yeah. great. Um, so you mentioned nostalgia and, you know, it coming back of things that are not so technology and animated and that extra step away. Do you think that part of it has to do with the pandemic in a way and that we've all been kind of locked up and that people are really yearning to feel some sort of connection and like a, and not have it all just be computers? Um, I don't think it had anything to do with the pandemic because a lot of the stuff was happening before the pandemic. I mean, okay. this has been going on for quite a few years now mm -hmm. that practical effects. I mean, we saw it in, um, that was one of the things in, uh, I think it was the, when Abrams did The Force Awakens, he wanted to go back to, you know, char practical characters. Um, you are starting to see it more in, in movies. And I think, I think it was just people just got, maybe they just got tired of CGI. It just became too, like, it, everybody knew it was a computer. Um, I don't know the exact reason for it. Um, I'm glad Me too. that it's coming back. Um, mm. But I don't know. I think maybe it's just the same reason that, you know, I had a love for it. I know with the, uh, the, the Mandalorian, this new show, the uh, baby Yoda, that was, that was a puppet. Mm -hmm. And they, fought to you know make that a puppet as opposed to just i think some of it was you know cgi but um for the majority of it yeah they still use the puppet um like i said i i don't i don't know what what brought this stuff back um maybe because we're just in the time of reboots it seems like we're just taking every old idea and redoing it and right. people are you know they're you know, complaining is like, oh, I guess, you know, Hollywood doesn't have any ideas, you know? Well, no, I think what happened was, is everybody was saying, you know, they just don't make movies and television like they used to. And then I think they right. said, all right, well, we'll just go back and make all the old stuff. <laughs> it's well, it, it's like, I, it's like Hollywood's responding to the nostalgia of the people. And a lot yeah. of people are saying, you know, where did the the realness come in, you know, wh where did it go away? I think you're correct. I think they got, you know, people got tired of everything being so computerized. Like where are the real actors and where are the real musicians and where are the, that characters, puppets or whatever, and, and not having it all totally computerized all the time. I think humans, because we naturally are meant to be connected. We're starting to get tired of being so disconnected. And I think Hollywood is just answering the call of the audience. Yeah. So it could be. I but don't that, know. But that's really what the audience know. wants. That's what they get. <laughs> it's it's so hard to figure out what Hollywood is doing or what they're going to do next. Or a lot of times they don't they don't even know. Right. It's Hollywood is a big game of follow the leader, and mm -hmm. whoever comes up with the good idea first, that's who you follow after that. 
Right. So, you know, if one person says, okay, well, I'm going to reboot an idea and it's a hit, then you're going to start seeing more and more reboots, you know, in right. things um, like this new karate kid, you know, mm -hmm. series that's out Cobra Kai. Where did that come from? Right. <laughs> now it's, right. it's like the biggest show right now, which is good. I'm glad. I'm glad that those actors are getting a second chance. Mm -hmm. So do that. Yeah, that's really cool. So you got reunited with the Christmas story, people after all of these things, into mm -hmm. the, a Christmas story family. And how did you get reunited with all your fellow actors? Well, we've been reunited for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, ever since the 28th anniversary, you know, and we went and did appearances and signings. So it wasn't like this, you know, 30 year gap where like, let's all get together. It's like, no, it, you know, we been together and then, um, you know, things just kind of slow down. And I guess recently, um, you know, Yano Anaya, uh, Yano Anaya, sorry, is the one who really kind of, you know, spearheaded this whole Christmas story family along with Emmanuel, who, by the way, I think both of them are doing an excellent job with this. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. You know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm surprised because I'm, I'm the skeptical one out of everybody <laughs> the most. Um, I'm always the one that says, mm, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if that's going to work. But hey, I always say if I'm wrong, then we're on a good, then we're at a good point. Um, if I'm right, then we're in trouble. Um, so I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and this is when I'm being good. wrong is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't mind being wrong because if I'm wrong, then we're at a good point. Things are think, good. Things are going to happen. If I'm right. Then yeah. Then, you know, pack up your bags. Um, <laughs> so I think it was just, you know, I, I never really sat down and asked him, why are you doing this again? Um, I, he was doing it and I just told him, I said, look, you need my help. I'm right here, whatever you need from me. Um, so it's, it's, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, I, I, like I said, I wasn't exactly positive about being a part of it at first. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really ready to just kind of move on mm -hmm. and let just w let it be what it is, you know, um, you know, the house is obviously very, very popular. Mm -hmm. The fans seem to love that. Um, I know they always ask, you know, they'll ask me, it's like, well, when are you going to be at the house next? I go, well, don't ask me, ask the house. It's up to them, not me. Um, but um, with this whole new social media idea, um, honestly, the fact that I don't actually have to go on the tours anymore. <laughs> um, I like this. So um, right. I like being a part of the Facebook page. I like now interacting with the fans. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to be more involved with uh, the Facebook page and the fans on the Facebook page. So, you know, it's a really good opportunity to, you know, talk to them and, and connect with them and still kind of, keep myself at a kicking distance mm -hmm. and just, you know, say hi and everything and, you know, interact with them. But cause the, the tours is just, I don't know. I kind of, kind of done with it. <laughs> so. Right. So the social media does make it a little bit more engaging that way. And like when the movie yes. first, when the movie first came out, it wasn't really a thing. And now it's no. a thing like in the beginning, Apparently. <laughs> it was, yeah, it wasn't all that popular. It was okay. And, um, and it's gay. I think it's in some ways gaining ground. And I think maybe nostalgia is a part of it or whatever, but I'm on that Facebook page. And um, then of course I interviewed Zach Ward and then I interviewed Yano and then I interviewed Emmanuel and now I'm talking to you. And if all, th all of your interviews have the same and similar kind of ideas, you know, and feels about them. Um, and I'm noticing that the page is even picking up more steam well after the holidays are over. It's that it, every time I go on social yes. media, there's three or four or five different posts I see right away from a Christmas story family that are people showing all kinds of interesting things. And so to me, it's very uplifting, you know, to 
kind of be in, on this page with all these people excited about something that's just a really cool movie. And they're really grateful that you guys are showing up like directly with the fans and, and on social media with them and, and seeing the gratitude and the appreciation and the happiness that goes with a Christmas story. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, I think it elevates everybody's mood. I think it's really serving a much bigger purpose than probably Emmanuel or Yano realized when they started it. And, um, yeah. you know, I really think so because I see that happening. And so I'm glad you're involved in. In fact, I saw something where somebody mentioned you or whatever. And I said, oh, I get to talk to him. <laughs> I know that guy now. <laughs> well, it, it's also going to be interesting because one one of the I, I wouldn't call it a problem, but one of the uh, the aspects of this film is that it only gets attention a certain time of year. And obviously that's around the holidays and which is great, but it would be nice if this movie would get attention throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And I think with this, this website, we're going to be able to do that and see, and it, it is going to, you know, we're, we're going to have to be more, you know, uh, proactive as that, with that as well. And that's why I'm, you know, saying I, I will be on the site more interacting with people so that, you know, cause remind them, it's like, Hey, you know, yeah, it's a holiday film, but you know, you don't just have to put it away, you know, in January, you know, we can still have fun with it throughout the year. It's still a movie and we're entertaining people and we'll keep you engaged throughout the year if you're willing. So, right. so it's going to be, this year is going to be interesting uh, for that. To see. It will, I think it will be very interesting because I do notice it's staying busy, the pages and lots of things happening and, you know, we're past the holidays and, I am reflecting right now on Emmanuel's interview. And so those of you who have not heard Zach's and Yano's and Emmanuel's interview yet, when you're listening to this show, all those links will be in the show notes of this show. So you can go listen to their interviews as well. And when Emmanuel talked a lot about how that movie really moved him as a young boy, where he really needed um, role models and other people to connect to in a way and how you're serving a bigger purpose than you can ever know. You know, like we never know how it's landing on people and the good that we're doing right. just by being ourselves. Right. And just stepping out of the, the shadows and saying, OK, let's like make this a thing that, to really help inspire people. And so I want to thank you for doing that for the world. It's a big deal. Cool. <laughs> um, it is. It, I think it's a big deal to uplift people. So I have another question. I have another, two more and then we can <laughs> then I'll let you go. <laughs> um, and that is. What is your most memorable food that you've ever eaten anywhere in the world? My most memorable food. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know. There's been so many. Um, what pops in your head first? That's the one I would like to know about. Anything seafood. I'm a big seafood fan. Yes. So, yes. you know, um, I guess the first time I tried sushi, <laughs> So that probably was a big, because I was just so against eating sushi. I didn't want to do it. I was like, ew, no, it's raw. I don't want it. But I had a friend kind of, kind of trick me into trying sushi. Um, he was very clever. So, cause it was his birthday. So he wanted to go out for sushi. He invited me along and he said, you know, you should try. I'm like, I don't, I don't eat raw fish. He's like, well, it's not always raw. Just, you can get the shrimp. I said, that's cooked. And there's a little piece of shrimp on a little piece of rice. Mm -hmm. I tried it. I was like, yeah, that is good. I like shrimp. And he's like, yeah, try the crab. I was like, okay. So I tried the crab also was good. And he's like, now try some salmon. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, just try it. I said, <laughs> okay. So I tried the salmon. I was like, that's it. This is it. This is it. So I'm now, I'm now a, a sushi fanatic. Of course, then in the same, uh, same night, he said, Hey, you want a cigarette? And I said, yeah, I don't really smoke. He's like, come on, just have a cigarette. Well, yeah, that's where I got hooked on smoking too. So. <laughs> wow. All in the same night. Okay. I know. So sushi <laughs> and cigarettes. It was like, <laughs> I, I don't smoke anymore. So, but I still eat sushi. So. Well, there you go. You saved you saved the one thing out of that night that, yeah, that worked for yeah. you, right? Oh, that's hysterical. That's great. 
So the last question of the day is, if you were going to have a billboard for the whole world to see, what is it going to say? I, I, I have one. I have this, this it's kind of not really like a quote, but something I, I always say. And if you can fit it on a billboard, I think it would be great. And it's something I, I, I try and keep in my mind every day. And it's um, the best way to get rid of an enemy is to make them laugh. Because if you can make your enemy laugh, then they'll become your friend and then they'll no longer be your enemy. Wow, that's powerful. That's amazing. Right. I think that's one of my favorites of all time. And I ask this question to everybody practically. Yeah. Wow. And I remember I remember telling that to somebody because it, it's kind of one of those like it's it's, it's not like a, a serious point. It's meant to be taken lightheartedly because obviously you can't make everybody laugh. But um, yeah, it's just, you know, if you there's somebody you don't like, you're at odds with. But if you make them laugh or get them to respect you, then they're no longer an enemy because now they're your friend. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way to get rid of an enemy. And then I had one person, this one guy tell me, he's like, well, you know, what if you can't tell a joke? I'm like, well, then just beat the shit out of them. That's another way to get rid of your enemy. But that's another way. But the laughter <laughs> so, part works really well, especially yeah. from you, the comedian, you know? Right. But if, if you, if, you know, if I, I guess if I could have a billboard, I would try and figure out a way to fit that on. That would, that would be my thing. But, oh, that's a great, um, that's a great answer. So is there anything that you wanted to share or talk about that I didn't ask you about today? I know I covered a lot of ground, but I just want to make sure that when we close the show, you, you feel complete. I, I don't know. I usually with, with these, I never really have anything else to, to say. It's, okay. you know, this is, this is where, you know, I guess this is where the improv part comes in. You know, you ask me questions, I give you information. <laughs> so, like I said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the lead guitarist. I'm the bass player. So I'll just keep, I just keep the rhythm going. Yeah, I love it. And I love bass players. I have a lot of <laughs> bass player friends and it's, there's a vibe about that. That is just beautiful and exquisite to me. Well, thank you, Ian, for being on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So you all have been listening to Ian Petrella, who was in A Christmas Story, but he also has amazing other talents and excitement about life because see, when you're gifted and you have multi-potentialities like Ian does, you have an experience of life that has rich dimension to it. So if you've enjoyed the show, check out the links to his co-actors from A Christmas Story. And we'll also put the link in there for the Facebook page that they're all on and interact with Ian and tell him you heard him here and how he inspired you today. So thank you again for being on the show. Or if I didn't inspire, you could tell me that too. Okay, you can tell them whatever you would like as long as it's honest and integrity. I saw I listened to your show and I didn't get anything from it. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as they're being honest and in integrity, we're good. Okay. So, so remember everybody to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. You're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and let your light shine. And remember until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well.